Hello and welcome to the studio live in Paris for this PCR webinar supported by Boston Scientific. I'm Dr. Chris Cook from the United Kingdom and I'm delighted to be joined live by our Heart Team panel. And here we welcome Dr. Won Kun Kim from Germany, Dr. Francesco Giannini from Italy, and joining us remotely, we have Dr. Sabine Bleitzifer, also from Germany. Today, we will be discussing how achieving optimal index procedural outcomes can positively influence future TABI treatment options. Our carefully considered learning objectives are as follows. Firstly, to understand how pre-procedural planning directly influences optimal procedural outcomes. Secondly, to become confident in achieving commissural alignment with the accurate NEO2 prosthesis. And lastly, to learn about the impact of securing future treatment options in the context of the lifetime management of aortic valve disease. So let's jump straight into the learning and we welcome Dr. Wong Kong Kim and he'll be talking to us about his insights on how to improve TAVI procedural outcomes. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris, um, for the nice introduction. Yeah, and it's a pleasure to share with you some um, thoughts on how to um, achieve procedural success, which uh, without doubt is uh, really um, the most important a goal that we uh, should um, pursue when we do a um, TAVI procedure. Um, let's uh, show the first slide. So there are several keys to procedure success. There are several components, and I think the most uh, two important components are uh, very um, careful pre-procedural planning that involves um, um, high quality imaging. In most cases, uh, this will be CT, but also procedural aspects play a role in order to achieve pre, uh, uh, procedural success. And I think we should keep in mind that what we do during the implantation, so the valve that we choose, the size, but also how we position it, whether we employ a commercial alignment or not, pre and post dilatation will affect long-term aspects in terms of durability, uh, future coronary access, and also future TAF and TAF. And I would like to pick up some of these aspects uh, during the next slides and go a little bit deeper. And I, I think the, the first um, uh, uh, um, aspect or the most important aspect is to have um, um, good access route. And uh, of course, the primary, um, the, the mostly used access is uh, femoral. And we should try to um, um, uh, have uh, most procedures via the femoral access route. But of course, there are limitations. You, you can see there's a wide, um, wide range of different anatomies uh, that uh, range from optimal to hostile. And uh, th there are limitations that we uh, need to take into account and to acknowledge. And um, also it's important not only to look at the um, uh, femoral axis side, but also to take into consideration the whole vasculature as you can see here. And I, I think sometimes we are uh, happy when we can overcome challenging anatomies as you can see on the left-hand side, it's a very tortuous um, aorta with acute angulation with a, a um, double wire technique. It was possible to um, uh, cross this um, difficult arch, but also there are um, uh, um, cases where we should be careful not to push the limits and we might have to live uh, with the consequences. So I, I think if there is a good femoral access, then we should uh, go for it. But if, if there is some difficulty, uh, we might be better off to uh, consider alternative access routes. I think the most important prerequisite for procedural success is sizing and um, correct sizing impacts PVL, as you can see, mismatch, um, um, it uh, impacts valve anchoring and also pacemaker rate. I think we should uh, take into account or um, I, I would like to highlight the fact that um, the analyst, when you measure it on CT, uh, undergoes um, um, uh, changes during the cardiac cycle. So if you measure an analyst in the systole, um, there might be such a big difference that uh, it, uh, um, there will be um, a change of valve size um, when, when compared to diastolic measurement. Also regarding the 
um, a spectrum of um, annular ranges that can be covered by the different sizes. There are also, um, of course differences and I think if you look at the mid-spectrum 21 to 25, 26 can probably be covered by any valve type. Um, the larger valve uh, uh, and, um, endless um, uh, ranges might be limited by um, availability of uh, sizes while when you go to the smaller sizes, you might have an increased risk of a prosthesis mismatch with uh, specific valve types. And pros a prosthesis um, a patient mismatch is a matter of debate, but I think there are signals and it is quite safe to uh, say that uh, probably uh, it is better to avoid um, prosthesis pa uh, patient mismatch. And I, I think we need to have an increased awareness uh, especially in patients um, that are in, uh, at increased risk for mismatch uh, such as high uh, body mass index or small annually and what can we do about it uh, uh, procedure wise we should try to avoid intraannular valves and uh, be very generous uh, when it comes to the decision whether you, uh, we do post dilatation or not so if you uh, see any residual gradient or uh, some um, uh, mal expansion, I would be very generous to do post dilatation. Here's a very um, illustrative um, case that I would like to demonstrate. Uh, this was a case with an accurate NEO2, and um, on, on the post, uh, post procedural echo showed um, PVL uh, moderate, but also we noted uh, there was an increased uh, mean gradient of 17 millimeters of mercury, and this patient, uh, by definition, had a severe prosthesis um, patient mismatch. We did post dilatation. Uh, I'm afraid the video will not work, but uh, you have to believe me that we um, uh, did post dilatation. And you can see on the right hand side the result, the mean gradient dropped to eight millimeters of mercury and there was no prosthesis patient mismatch anymore. Um, I think uh, we can say that calcium is uh, uh, one of the um, greatest enemies of TAVI and of course in order to overcome calcium, we need uh, um, prosthesis with higher radio force. And um, I think there is a controversy of which um, valve type is um, better in especially very calcified anatomies uh, with uh, the downsides of incomplete expansion or PVL in um, uh, pro um, prosthesis with lower radio force or another rupture or um, coronary occlusion in um, prosthesis with high radio force. Permanent pacemaker implantation, we should try to avoid it. Um, there are also some um, uh, um, uh, um, factors regarding the valve type. We know that the valve type also determines the um, risk of pacemaker implantation. Implantation death plays a role and uh, um, recently um, different techniques, uh, especially the cuss overlap technique, have uh, uh, demonstrated a reduction of um, pacemaker implantation. For access, I think uh, there are some strategies to mitigate uh, or to improve coronary, to preserve coronary access. Uh, for instance, use, um, use of short standard frames, commercial alignment and optimal implantation depth. I, w uh, I do not want to go too much into detail because uh, Francesco will um, elaborate on this uh, topic later on. Finally, I would like to show you um, um, protocol that we use, uh, it's an approach that allows for single arterial access and use of very low contrast agent and um, you can see um, how we do it on the left hand side, there's a wire, it's a, a regular arterial wire placed in the non-coronary cusp to indicate the position of the um, analyst and uh, facilitates positioning and um, implantation with uh, minimal or with no use of contrast agent. This is how it looks like on the bench, uh, you can see there's the um, wire in the non-coronary um, part and uh, the valve opens. And um, this um, protocol allows to substitute uh, every step that requires uh, the use of contrast agent with either ultrasound, as you can see here. Instead of performing um, an angiogram, we do ultrasound and can visualize uh, pathologies and also um, after treatment, uh, um, the, uh, the improvement um, of, of this um, uh, um, pseudoaneurysm. And um, with this uh, protocol, uh, we are able to reduce the average amount to uh, 25 cc. And um, I think it's applicable if you feel comfortable 
with uh, um, with uh, um, uh, renouncing to um, uh, using contrast agent. And I would like to summarize, uh, you can achieve uh, opti optimal procedural outcomes by um, uh, procedural uh, planning, especially uh, imaging, and uh, by um, observing uh, procedural aspects um, in, in terms of uh, uh, commercial alignment, uh, correct positioning, and um, uh, um, uh, uh, to, uh, trying to achieve a good implantation there. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Juan, for that. And like any great operator, you're highly adaptable to changing situations with your need for yeah. ex extra audiovisual <laughs> equipment. Yeah. So well done, and thank you for that excellent overview. And we will revisit many of these uh, uh, key topics in both the clinical case um, and subsequent talks. Okay, I'm really keen to get some discussion uh, going now. Um, and Sabine, I'd like to come to you first, if possible, please. Are you still with us remotely? Yes, I am, sure. Fantastic. Hello, great to see you. And you. So, of course, you are a cardiac surgeon um, and achieving perfect valve results under direct visualisation in the operating room has always been the standard for you. And as we now enter into this next chapter of TAVI in the younger patient, the lower risk patient, my question is, what insights can you bring from your surgical experience regarding achieving optimal TAVI outcomes? Thank you for this question. I would say there are some um, parallels and differences uh, uh, regarding outcomes of uh, TAVI and uh, surgery concerning the procedural results. So as surgeons, we are um, really aware that our procedural um, uh, details do influence uh, future outcomes of the patient. For example, we are very keen on avoiding any procedural complications such as bleeding because we know rethoracotomy then increases the risk of wound healing disturbances, for example. And um, we uh, always aim for zero PBL. Usually we don't accept any PBL during a surgical aortic valve replacement. Uh, commissural alignment is um, a part of the procedure, so that's uh, nothing we uh, had thought of as surgeons in the uh, past. We um, are, are very aware of um, how important good hemodynamics are, and we um, have several uh, protocols how to avoid patient prosthesis mismatch. Also, with the idea to avoid future structural heart, uh, structural valve deterioration. And we also know that post-procedural care does influence uh, the outcomes. For example, we have to uh, mobilize the patients very fast to, to avoid immobilization or pneumonia or things like that. And we, um, of course, have an antithrombotic management in mind. So these are my points, I would say, that, are, that we are aware of to, um, to improve the post-procedural outcomes. Thanks so much for that, Sabine. It's really great to hear your insights. And in fact, these are exactly the same principles that we now apply to transcatheter therapies as well. OK, Francesco, so coming to you now, TAVI is clearly now a very mature procedure and technology. And if we're focusing on reproducible, excellent outcomes, what are the critical steps or concepts of TAVI in which we must achieve perfection? Thank you, Chris, for the question. Uh, I think uh, uh, what we know is that probably our approach in performing TVR has been changing over the time. Uh, the first priority is to be to try once again to have a safe procedure avoiding major complication. In this regard, uh, it's of course important to have a safe management of vascular access. At the same time, we have to try to optimize procedural results to get better long-term patient survival. And what we have to do is to try to have a good THB function at the end of the procedure, uh, so without having paravalvular leak, uh, avoiding a residual gradient, patient prosthesis mismatch, try not to have need of pacemaker implantation at the end of the procedure. But probably that's not enough uh, if we look at younger patients with longer life expectancy. Probably we have also to think about future treatment options that actually means 
to have coronary reaccess and PCI feasible after TVR and to be able to perform uh, uh, reduce TAVR in case of need, I think probably once again uh, the pre-procedural planning, uh, a good selection of the valve, uh, a good selection of the implantation technique uh, has to be uh, really uh, taken in consideration uh, and uh, mainly driven by the patient characteristic and the specific anatomical issues. Fantastic, thank you for the answer and what I really like about that is it starts with the pre-procedure and it goes all the way to thinking about future procedures many years down the line. Okay, so one last question to you is, you shared some really interesting data there about low contrast TAVI. Um, zero contrast PCI is beginning to gain traction. Do you think we can push the limits to get to that level within TAVI? Yeah, actually this is what we have started doing in our center. It's not zero uh, contrast. We, uh, we only um, apply contrast um, actually uh, for the final autogram, but try to avoid um, um, applying contrast agent in every other, other steps. So for instance, um, angiography and also the um, uh, um, angiograms with the pigtail. And you, you have to think about what, what you want to show or um, um, image. And it's, uh, for instance, um, the vasculature when you puncture um, or the position of the no, um, analyst, the, the non coronary cusp. And I think um, in most cases, this can be done by um, other means than um, applying contrast agent. I have seen um, uh, procedures where uh, um, a lot of contrast agent has been um, given only to, uh, to uh, check the fluoroscopic plane, um, 100 cc. And uh, I, I think uh, this, could be, uh, um, this could be managed differently. Um, it's very important if you do um, use such a protocol that you do not compromise and those who use uh, such an um, approach have to be, uh, 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 be very comfortable with it. So there should be no compromise. But I think it's possible. We have seen um, a lot of benefits, um, uh, um, uh, market reduction of kidney injury, and what we have also seen as a reduction in um, delirium. I don't know whether it's related to the uh, low amount of contrast agent, but you have seen the average amount that we use is 25 cc. That's really impressive. And you know what I like about it is it's just achieving the next level, isn't it? It's pushing forward and, and, and trying to achieve procedural excellence, which is what we're here to talk about today. OK, so let's take these learnings to the next level now and apply them to a real patient in whom the index procedure definitely will have important implications on their future treatment options. So let me introduce our patient to you. She's a 62-year-old female, and she does have multiple medical comorbidities, specifically type 2 diabetes, obstructive lung disease, chronic kidney disease, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and morbid obesity, and very limited mobility. Her presentation was an acute one, and she presented to one of our referring hospitals with shortness of breath and chest pain. Her admission chest x-ray identifies that this patient has a degree of pulmonary edema, her 12-lead ECG reveals relatively non-specific lateral T-wave inversions. She proceeds on to have an invasive coronary angiogram and has angiographically unobstructed coronaries. And the diagnosis is made really on transthoracic echo, where we can see that this patient has critical aortic stenosis with a peak gradient of 116, a mean of 71, and a hyperdynamic LV with an ejection fraction of 60%. So let's think now about the subsequent heart team discussion, where we really need to focus down on these medical comorbidities. Unfortunately, her type 2 diabetes is very poorly controlled on a combination of metformin and insulin, and she has a grossly elevated HbA1c. Her lung disease reveals a severe obstructive picture. Her kidney disease identifies an estimated glomeration filtration rate of 46. And with regards to her morbid obesity, she's a short patient, 150 centimetres, but weighs 107 kilos, giving her a body mass index of 47. This has left her largely wheelchair and mobility scooter bound. And when she was encouraged to walk, she had a grossly depressed gait speed of just 0.3 metres per second. 
So when you consider these and formal STS risk score for isolated surgical aortic valve replacement, this generates an almost 12% chance of mortality, identifying to us that this is certainly a high risk surgical case. Therefore, we proceed on to do CT planning. And what you see here is a tricuspid aortic valve. And you'll note there's a relative lack of calcification here. And this is predominantly a sclerotic valve. And you'll also see that there's large scale left ventricular hypertrophy and a small LV cavity. If we now go on and do the dimensions, we can see that the annulus measures 24 by 21 with an area of 369, an average diameter of 21.7 and a perimeter of 69.4. So on the smaller side of things. If we look now down towards the landing zone in the LVOT, you can see that there is a slight funneling configuration with an area of 392, a maximal diameter of 26.5 and a perimeter of 72. In the coronary height, obviously critically important in a patient as young as this, we have a left coronary height of 11 millimeters and on the right, 12 millimeters. If we look now at the actual sinuses, we can see again that this is on the slightly smaller side of things, averaging approximately 29 millimeters. And we can see, see here also a relatively narrow STJ measuring at just under 23 millimeters. Now we're going to look at the access and peripheral anatomy. And the first striking aspect of this is, is of course, the excess in subcutaneous tissue and particularly fat apron. What I want us all to do now is to focus on that right femoral and iliac anatomy. And as we scroll through, you can see that visually these appear to be small vessels. There's a relative lack of calcification. And as the vessels constitute, you'll see that there is some plaque there in the descending aorta. If we now turn our attention to the 3D reconstruction, we can see here that again, to the eye, the vessels appear to be small. I now tend to rotate my image to get a better understanding of the bifurcation height, and it's not prohibitively high. I then like to follow up the aorta, making sure that there's no concealed tortuosities. And then lastly, also have a look at the aortic root complex to make a decision about how easy it will be to deliver around the arch. And you can see here that valve delivery, deliverability will certainly be a consideration. So let's put some numbers on the vessel dimensions and we see that we do see, do see some borderline measurements here of 5.3 and 4.95 millimeters respectively. And again, we can see that the vertical depth from the top of the fat apron to the preferred puncture point is in fact 12 centimeters in this patient. So let's summarize the case. This is a 62 year old female with critical aortic stenosis who is comorbid and high surgical risk. Her CT has identified a relatively low calcium burden at just under 1000 on the aortic valve and a smallish annulus, STJ and aortic root complex. Her iliacs are small caliber and she has very deep common femoral arteries. So the challenges here are multiple. <coughs> Predominantly, there is consideration around safety of vascular access but also some interesting discussions around the THV choice. And things that we need to consider are about the deliverability of the device, the certain risk of patient prosthesis mismatch, pre preservation of coronary access, the absolute requirement to minimalize paravalvular leak, preserve conductions, and of course, to think about the ability to perform TAV and TAV as a revalving procedure. Okay. So an interesting case and one that illustrates, I think, a large number of factors that we need to consider in this young patient, albeit with extensive comorbidities. So Sabine, we really have, have to come to you first as the surgeon. Um, is this patient a surgical candidate? So I would say, yes, she could be a surgical candidate. Um, First of all, we look at this uh, very high risk score. That means um, she should undergo TAVI, but it's not a low risk TAVI also. So it is a perfect case to be discussed by the heart team. We have to put together all the aspects of both procedures. If she would undergo surgery, she has a high risk for prolonged ventilation, for wound healing disturbance, for impaired mobilization post-surgically uh, post and for patient prosthesis mismatch. And only two of those, the wound healing and uh, patient prosthesis mismatch, can be addressed by perfect surgical technique. 
When she undergoes a TAVI procedure, she also has some risks. She has a risk of patient prosthesis mismatch, of PVL, of vessel complications, and maybe also for coronary obstructive, uh, obstruction, although this is not so high. So I think our task now today is to put all this together and um, to decide which factors are most important to the patient to come to the best decision. Absolutely. And I mean, that discussion really mirrors exactly what happened uh, in, in the local heart team as well. So thank you for your contribution. OK, Juan, well, so if we are considering that we may be heading towards a transcatheter approach in this patient, um, can you give us your initial opinion on what we've seen with regards to the vascular access in this patient? Uh, what would your approach be? Yeah, I think uh, you, you might have, uh, you might recall the slide I showed you. I think she's rather on the more difficult side. Um, not because of the vascular itself, um, it looks um, rather healthy, there's no calcium, mm -hmm. it's uh, straight um, vessels, but uh, um, the uh, size of the vessel is borderline, depending on the uh, system that uh, you would like to use. And uh, also, I think the most challenging aspect is the high distance to the vessel. And, uh, and also, um, uh, a compression after the procedure, which, which is frequently um, necessary. Yeah, <clears throat> I absolutely agree. And what I really liked in your discussion point there is it's, it's around the extra features you get from the CT, like tortuosity, lack of calcium. Um, and that can sometimes potentially allow us to push the limits when it comes to uh, the smaller vessels, for example. OK, Francesco, let's move on to think about the THV choice here. Um, just to recap, the patient has a smallish annulus and she has a very high BMI and she's, of course, very young. So what do we need to consider and what is your approach to valve selection in these types of cases? Uh, yeah, I think you are completely right. You just uh, underlined the two main factors uh, uh, that we have to take account uh, in the valve selection. Uh, these are two very strong predictors of patient prosthesis mismatch, both uh, body mass index very high in this lady, uh, but also at the same time the relatively small annulus. Uh, probably what we can do is to try to uh, select uh, a supranular valve that seems to provide better results in terms of hemodynamic performance and at the same time also to think, uh, um, to look at the future and thinking about valve durability in a 62 uh, years old lady. But at the same time, uh, we have uh, a small aorta uh, with uh, quite small sinus of valsalva, uh, short virtual basal ring to sinotubular junction. Uh, the coronary hostia seems to be quite low. We have also at the same time thinking about uh, coronary reaxis, uh, considering also uh, the young age of the patient. And probably uh, this is why I would not consider in this patient uh, a long stent frame valve with a closed cell. So I would try to select a valve with open cell that allowed uh, uh, coronary access uh, after TBR. Fantastic. I mean, there's multiple, multiple considerations, as you say. Um, and again, that's exactly the type of discussions that we have in our heart team to understand not just optimal procedure now, but laying the foundations for, for the subsequent years ahead. OK, so Sabine, uh, if you're still there with us, um, with this patient at the age of 62, it is likely that they will need revalving in the future. So what additional procedural challenges does TAV and TAV pose? So concerning procedural challenges, um, I would say that you have always to take into consideration the risk of coronary occlusion with the uh, leaflets of the first TAVI valve um, or impair just impairment of coronary flow, which also might uh, cause myocardial infarction. And um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of data about um, uh, valve and valve or TAF and TAF. And so it is um, today at our center, we would not um, influence our decision for the first TAVI um, by these considerations because we want to achieve the best result or, or the things we know now during the first uh, procedure and choose the best valve um, for, for the situation now. Okay, I think that is a really important key learning uh, that you've just delivered there, which is to not lose perspective on the issue. And really, we must be focusing on achieving 
optimal procedural outcomes at the index procedure, but perhaps with a, a healthy <coughs> respect and understanding of what can happen in, with regards to lifetime management. Okay, so thank you for the discussion and uh, lots to think about, and we will come back to the case uh, towards the end of the webinar. But first, let's explore two critically important topics for our patient as we hand over now to Francesco to talk to us about valve choice and its impact on durability and future treatment options. So thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, as we uh, already mentioned, uh, uh, if we move to younger patients at lower risk profile, uh, uh, TVR safety and uh, optimal procedure outcome uh, uh, is not uh, sufficient, but probably uh, it's crucial also to look at valve durability and future treatment options. And uh, what matters in this regard? Of course, valve selection plays a crucial role in both the first THP selection, but also sequence and combination of different platforms, thinking at the future in case of uh, uh, reduce EVR need. At the same time, uh, implantation technique has to be also performed looking at the future of the patient, at the future of the valve, uh, but we have also to uh, improve our skill, our knowledge to facilitate coronary access after TVR. In terms of long-term durability, uh, we know we have limited data, but what we know so far is that TVR is not inferior to SAVR in terms of all cause mortality at eight years follow-up. Uh, these are data from the Notion 1 trial, and TVR was surprisingly associated with a less common structural valve deterioration, uh, probably due to the fact that the supranular valve design was utilized uh, with better hemodynamic performance. And we know how it's important to achieve an optimal THV function at the end of our procedure uh, to optimize valve durability. Uh, in these regards, it was recently published a propensity match analysis study uh, showing as the uh, supranular accurate Neo2 platform as compared to the intranular sub ultra is associated uh, uh, with a better hemodynamic performance, uh, lower residual ingredient, uh, uh, significant reduction of a severe patient prosthesis mismatch that finally resulted in a better device access and we can expect the better hemodynamic performance to have an impact on long-term valve durability. At the same time, implantation technique has to be performed in try to achieve an optimal THB function, looking for example at the implantation uh, uh, death, try to optimize it. Uh, try not to accept suboptimal valve expansion and at the same time also commissural alignment seems to play a role in terms of uh, a better hemodynamic uh, uh, result. Coronary access after TVR we know is a main issue in the reaccess study by Marco Barbanti and colleagues, uh, uh, coronary reaccess uh, uh, was unsuccessful in a not negligible number of cases, around 8%. And this is quite relevant considering the high prevalence of coronary artery disease in TVR patient population. At the same time, the study provided uh, several predictors of uh, uh, coronary reaccess and feasibility, mainly anatomical factors, as we know, implantation death, but also valve selection with long stent uh, frame valve associated with the worse outcome in terms of uh, uh, coronary reaccess. Uh, as already mentioned, commissural alignment plays a crucial role. Probably what we have to do is not to try to achieve the best possible commissural alignment, but at least we have to try to avoid commissural misalignment, uh, leaving uh, uh, the valve post in front of the hostium, so uh, making more challenging the coronary reaccess. In this regard, uh, the common line study uh, as compared to the most utilized uh, uh, self-expandable devices uh, showing a very high success rate of commissural alignment with the whole platform uh, with the highest rate observed with the accurate near to uh, probably due to the clear stent frame. And probably uh, coronary reaccess is uh, a typical field in which ex vivo model simulation can provide uh, important insight and this is why we spent a lot of time in trying to develop uh, a passion-specific pulsatile flow simulator 
uh, with anatomical models uh, uh, created by using a post-procedural CT of real patient undergoing uh, uh, TVR and working in a full and complete catheterization laboratory environment uh, uh, with real equipment and everything looks like to perform a real procedure. One of the first things we became aware is the fact that at least uh, with a unique split level design of the accurate NEO2 with a short frame and large cell at the stabilization arches level, uh, we can achieve uh, uh, coronary engagement by using an internal approach, advancing a Howard catheter in a standard way, but having some risk of leaflets interaction uh, related to the baseline anatomy or we can use an external approach, approaching the target sinus oval salva from above with specific catheters completely bypassing the valve structure, so avoiding any kind of interaction with the leaflets. And this second approach seems to be quite useful in a more complex scenario like commissural misalignment and coronary ostia location below the neoskirt. Uh, this was initially investigated in a valve-in-valve -valve setting, but can be also applied in a, a TVR setting or a do TVR setting, like in this case, in which a balloon expandable valve was implanted in a low position inside the accurate NEO2. Uh, in a complex serial patient anatomy uh, with the coronary ostia located below the neoskirt uh, and the valve to sinotubular junction of less than two millimeters. So by using uh, an internal standard approach, uh, you can see, is not possible to engage the left main. Uh, with the uh, left Judkins force, we always get stuck uh, uh, against the leaflets of the first THV, and the fluoroscopy does not help at all in understanding why we cannot advance further our catheter. In the same anatomy, in less than one minute is possible uh, uh, by using a Judkins left six guiding catheter and advancing it uh, toward the inner curve of the ascending aorta to engage uh, the coronary. Uh, first to approach the sinus of valsalva without having any kind of interaction uh, with the valve leaflets. And this can be uh, a useful trick uh, uh, to manage more complex uh, anatomy. The same case uh, show as, uh, um, how is important the implantation height of the second THV in case of reduced TVR. In this case, uh, a balloon expandable position uh, in a low site finally resulted uh, uh, in a uh, dynamic risk plane due to the leaflets overhang uh, with the free access in the diastolic fa fa uh, phase of the cardiac cycle. Uh, so making uh, uh, this uh, coronary engagement feasible instead of uh, resulting in a complete sequestration of the uh, sinus of Valsalva. So I want to just to conclude uh, uh, showing as probably in the future we will approach our coronaries. And this is something that we can do in ex vivo models and hopefully we will do also in our patients. So by using only fluoroscopy, uh, we will uh, uh, probably be able uh, to evaluate the baseline anatomy complexity, evaluating coronary ostia 8 in relation to our valve, sinus of valsalva dimension, but also commissural alignment. And then uh, accordingly, uh, we will tailor our approach utilizing a specific uh, uh, catheters, uh, uh, specific techniques to avoid uh, unsuccessful uh, uh, attempts that uh, can be also dangerous. Thank you for your attention. Well, I think that was really fascinating, some of the work that's been put into this. And correct me, these are patient-specific 3D models, aren't they? Exactly, yeah. So it is a benchtop model, but it, it is based on actual biology. And I was struck by looking at the camera images there. And actually, the leaflet overhang is a dynamic process, but it didn't seem to cause any real consideration or concern about coronary obstruction. So to me, that's, that's very reassuring. OK, so thank you, Francesco. Um, let's get back to our case now um, and find out what happened and, and see whether or not we can bring together any of the uh, learnings that we've had uh, to date. So let's revisit our patient. OK, so case treatment, of course, as we've discussed, starts first with regards to the treatment strategy at the pre-procedural phase. And so this starts first in this particular patient with considerations around access. 
Dr. Wan uh, Kung Kim was explaining to us that these are borderline transferable, but and indeed we agreed. However, of course, the evidence base for TAVI does lie within the transferable route. And you'll see that with the use of a paniculus retraction, simple device, which I'll show in the next slide, we were confident um, and successful in obtaining uh, right transferable access in this patient. So the next consideration, uh, uh, which is what Francesco was also talking about, is consideration around the optimal THV choice. And for this particular patient, we elected to use a medium accurate NEO2. Based on the relatively small annulus and the key learning, where we talked about having a supraannular prosthesis in these patients who are at risk of patient prosthesis mismatch. And taking into account the slightly flared configuration of the LVOT, we selected a medium accurate. In combination with this borderline femoral anatomy, we can also use the eye sleeve, which is a very lubricious and flexible sheath in these types of small minimal lumen diameter cases. And the last consideration is around deliverability, particularly around the aortic arch. And for such a long prosthesis, the flexibility within the accurate NEO2 device is very, very good. And therefore, we were assured and, and confident of valve delivery around that arch. And we've talked again repeatedly about pre-procedural planning and the importance of that. So there are many other considerations that we weighed up at the pre-procedural phase. This included the elective use of a Safari extra small wire, given that we know that this is a small cavity. Also, commissural alignment, which we've discussed and will revisit again in this patient, is a must at this age, at 62, with a background history of diabetes. And lastly, we've talked about deployment techniques. And although much of the field has moved towards higher implants for the mitigation of pacing, in this particular patient, we slightly adapted our approach, aiming for a deeper deployment for considerations around revalving in the future, but also confident and aware of the low pacemaker risk associated with this particular THV prosthesis. OK, so let's now think about vascular access. And you remember that I talked about a paniculus retraction device. Well, this is quite simply just a large sticker, which was initially developed in the uh, obstetric field for use in obese patients undergoing caesarean sections. But as you can see, by simply applying this device, you change the surface anatomy dramatically. And it just so happens for us as TAVI operators, this gives us great access to the, tra uh, to the transfemoral TAVI route. And if you remember, the vertical height on this patient's particular CT was 12 centimeters. And following paniculus retraction, we can see the actual ultrasound during the case. And we can see that we've managed to reduce that and augment the anatomy, taking it down to just a penetration depth of two centimeters. So we then go ahead and perform vascular access, ultrasound guided micropuncture. And here you can see step one, we make use of all of we can within the cath lab. So we have fluoroscopic markings. We use ultrasound guided micropuncture. My personal practice starting in the longitudinal access to ensure a good trajectory, particularly in the larger patient. And then switching to the short axis to ensure an anterior stick. Once passage of the wire is performed, I then utilize that and perform fluoro and look for the interaction or the, the change from the radio opaque needle to the wire. And you can see that this is over the mid femoral head. That means I'm then confident to upsize to the four French micropuncture sheath and introduce some contrast into the artery, identifying a near optimal puncture point. We then proceed um, to insert the sheath without any difficulty. And we insert the extra small safari wire into the left ventricle. And there are a number of features on this static image which I think are useful for learning. Firstly, we see that the wire has found the apex. The wire is hugging the outer curve, which is particularly important for the accurate NEO2, providing great stability as a rail to work upon. And lastly, the wire has dropped into the commissure. And all these three features provide a very stable platform to deliver the accurate NEO2 prosthesis. As is highly recommended with this device, we go ahead and perform a balloon aortic valvuloplasty, which again is uneventful in the patient. And then we go on to uh, deliver the valve around the arch without difficulty and perform commissural alignment. 
Now, this is a simple technique, and indeed, it can be simplified as a three-step technique. Step number one is simply to introduce with the safety pin pointing down towards six o'clock. You then deliver the valve round to near the annulus, and you perform step two. This involves being in the three-cusp coplanar view and then focusing in on the radio opaque markers you can see within the valve. And here we're focusing on the three so-called cobs, and here you can see highlighted in orange that they're equally separated in terms of distance. And so we call this a one plus one plus one. Now what this means, in combination with having had the safety pin at the six o'clock position, is that we are very likely to be commissurally aligned However, we must go on and perform step three, which confirms whether or not we are fully commissurally aligned or fully non-aligned. And this is simply done by putting the C-arm into the two cusp overlap view, and the same rules apply, focusing in on the valve, but critically now looking for the free cell highlighted here in green, and in the simplest terms, ensuring that it's pointing towards the right of the screen. In this situation, you have successfully completed commercial alignment for the accurate NEO2. Now let's think about deployment and specifically deployment height. The image on the left shows the radio opaque marker at the level just above the annulus. Now in this particular case, the intention was to de deploy this slightly more deeper than normally one would with the accurate NEO2. And here you can see we're just at the limit of where the crown is still just managing to capture the left cusp. Keeping the device still and with a gentle forward pressure, we then deliver the second stage of deployment. And you'll see this is a top-down deployment for this prosthesis. And as normal, it moves slightly onwards. And what I was struck with when we review this fluoro image is that you can see that the self-expanding valve has nicely conformed and well expanded within the LVOT and indeed you can actually see it moving with systolic uh, and diastolic function and again if you remember back to that pre-procedural planning this is exactly what we would expect for this slightly funneled configuration. So now let's think about revalving considerations here we can see that we have got these two gaps down the side of the valve, which is exactly what we saw in Francesco's uh, camera uh, uh, videos. Additionally, now, if we think about how the valve is, has been deployed with regards to the annulus, you'll remember we aimed for a slightly deeper deployment in this younger patient. Now, what this has achieved means that we now have only a leaflet overhang height of five millimeters, which again, in combination with the slight hourglass shape of the Accurate Neo 2, means that I think we can be confident of revalving success here, most likely with a balloon expandable valve in the future. Here now we can assess the uh, uh, aortogram result, and you'll see that there's no paravalvular leak uh, in this uh, patient's case. And with regards now to invasive hemodynamics, so we did uh, invasive hemodynamics here and found actually a peak-to-peak -peak gradient of 15 and a mean of 7. This is in the context of now very elevated systolic blood pressures, as often happens when you relieve critical aortic stenosis such as this. And so the key consideration, and one that we will talk about shortly on the panel, is whether or not to perform post-dilatation. Now, in view of the relatively low amount of calcium for anchoring and the fact that the valve was well expanded, my personal preference was not to post-dilate in this situation, but I'm looking forward to see what the panel suggests. So this brings us towards the end of the case now. We had an uneventful uh, vessel closure with a two proglides. We can see that despite the very deep deployment of the valve, we see there's very minimal interruption with regards to conduction with a borderline left bundle. And our patient was successfully discharged home at day two making use of that time to really optimize her blood pressure control now that we'd relieved the stenosis. She was restarted on her normal anticoagulation with the indication being her atrial fibrillation and we stopped her aspirin. Okay, so let's have a discussion around this case. And I think there were both 
lots of challenges in the index procedure, um, uh, but also challenges when thinking about lifetime treatments as well. Um, and I'll be completely transparent. For me, I struggled mostly here with whether or not to perform post dilatation. Uh, and I'm really keen to see what um, uh, us as a panel think. So just to recap, the native um, uh, aortic valve was not excessively calcified here. We used a medium accurate Neo2 uh, with good expansion um, and no uh, paravalvular leak. Um, yet there was this residual gradient of 15, peak to peak, and a mean of seven. So Sabine, I'd like to come to you. Um, and perhaps if you can start just by explaining what you think is an acceptable hemodynamic result, uh, and then I'm keen to know, would you have post-dilated here? So first of all, I, uh, you have to be congratulated for this great result in this um, quite difficult anatomy of this patient. And so um, our concept is we post-dilatate usually if the gradient, the mean gradient is above 10. So in your patient, um, it would have been really discussable. What I recognize is that there is some waste. Um, the valve makes um, quite some oversizing. You maybe could also have chosen a, a size S valve in this uh, anatomy. So I'm really undecided. So concerning the hemodynamics, I would have not post-dilatated. Okay, thank you. I think, you know, it does illustrate the, the difficulty of this. It's a binary decision. Do you post-dilate at the end or, or do you not? Um, one, I, I'm really interested, uh, and it's the same question to you. Firstly, would you have post-dilated? Uh, to be honest, I would have post-dilated. Um, I agree with uh, um, Sabina that um, there is a, a slight waste in the... Um, um, mid stand part and um, I think there is quite an oversizing and uh, in in our um, institution we try to uh, abolish any gradient uh, because uh, what you measure invasively if you um, follow up um, uh, post um, 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 pre discharge echoes usually um, if, if you have a residual gradient uh, on invasive um, uh, pressure tracings the um, uh, gradients on echo you, you know, you, they don't match uh, because of pressure recovery, but um, they usually will, will be higher. And um, my question to you would be, um, d did you have uh, um, discharge echo measurements? Uh, how yeah, was the we gradient? did. Uh, was there any uh, mismatch? So she had a, a velocity of 2.5 yeah. um, on, on the discharge echo. So that's why I want to bring this to the table, yeah. is to say, yes, excellent optimal procedural outcomes index, but we do need to be thinking about subsequent um, on ongoing. So when, what, what are the factors Maybe. that make you can consider post dilatation? Can you summarize it to, yeah. to, to the... I, I think post dilatation, and I think uh, Francesco showed a very um, excellent slide. You, you need to have full expansion in order to mitigate the risk of a prosthesis uh, patient mismatch. And um, I think uh, in, in this specific case, what, what you should, uh, um, uh, what would be very interesting to follow up is whether um, there is a spontaneous expansion over time because there is um, not, a, um, a, not a high calcium burden. So I, I think there's a chance that uh, there will be some improvement in terms of gradient. So it would be very interesting to follow up this patient if you if you find um, that there is a, um, a mismatch, you have seen the example I've shown, it, it is possible to do a stage postulation in terms of improving uh, long-term outcomes and um, you have seen the illustration, uh, it works. It does, it certainly does. But do we have any understanding of, of whether patient prosthesis mismatch translates into anything in the TAVI field? Have we got that data yet? Um, we, we don't have um, we don't have um, many data yet, but there there, there is um, the uh, the assumption that uh, prosthesis patient mismatch is one factor contributing to um, uh, um, um, long term durability. Absolutely, yeah. it certainly has biological plausibility. Yes. Okay, Francesco. So, mm, of course, you can absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to add uh, one technical point. What we also do um, in all uh, procedures is a transversic echo. So we take together our decisions for post-dilation or not with the echo also, where we measure gradient and PVL. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and you know, the VARC2 guidelines do give us an algorithm to, to think about in those types of situations. So thank you. Um, 
Francesco, we're talking about post-dilatation and we're talking about the potential benefits of it. What are the potential risks of post-dilatation and can you share with us any tips from your own practice? In this case, coming back to the specific case, uh, uh, finally, uh, you intentionally perform the low implantation uh, death of the valve. So uh, one of the main risks when we uh, think about post-dilatation is potentially to have an embolization of the valve in case of a failure during the rapid uh, pacing, for example. But in this case, probably uh, this is only a relative risk just because of the low implantation height. It tends to occur more frequently when uh, the valve is implanted in a very high position, almost at the virtual basal ring level. Uh, what we are afraid, of course, and we is a, is a very nightmare when we think about post-dilatation, is the annular rupture. And what we have to do is definitely to um, be uh, precise in considering uh, uh, the diameter of the balloon that we are going to use without uh, exceeding the average diameter of our built basal ring. At the same time, uh, we have to perform an effective rapid pacing if we perform it uh, uh, with the, uh, with the um, standard pacemaker, we have to be sure that uh, the pacemaker is in the right position and uh, it's better always when it's risky this, uh, um, uh, this procedural step to test it before to perform the post dilatation. But I think in this case, yes, I want to just to uh, just give my opinion. Probably uh, we have also to consider to post dilate it according to the patient we are treating. So if uh, uh, we reach this final uh, result with some uh, um, sub expansion of the valve uh, in a very old patient, I would accept it. But considering uh, the young patient of uh, um, uh, in this case, probably I would have considered the post dilatation uh, regardless of the residual gradient that is acceptable, of course, regardless of the para paravalvular leak that was known in this case, but just to have uh, a proper expansion of the valve because we still don't know uh, if there is an impact on this on long term durability. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for uh, sharing the opinions on the panel. It's really helpful. So lastly, Sabine, this patient um, was recommenced back onto her usual anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation, which I guess potentially will provide a degree of benefit against HALT um, and thus potentially uh, protection against uh, structural valve deterioration. But can you please remind us um, of the latest guidelines regarding antiplatelet uh, and anticoagulant use post havi which uh, just shows the table out of the new guidelines um, where we have uh, a class one recommendation for oral anticoagulation uh, if there is an indication and only single antiplatelet therapy um, in patients without uh, indication for oral anticoagulation. So um, you, you did um, this uh, as uh, <laughs> you did uh, the guideline um, recommendation. And that's what we also would do in Bad Oeynhausen. To me, it was always um, interesting to understand that uh, what we do in surgery is three months of um, warfarin um, in patients without indication for anticoagulation. This is a class 2A indication only. Um, but uh, we know there is uh, some lower incidence of HALT or valve thrombosis after surgical aortic biprosthetic valve replacement. So Maybe uh, there is something without um, uh, about this um, anticoagulation management. And um, I always question why we don't do a study uh, comparing this for TAVI patients also. Thanks very much. There's lots of nodding and agreement on the panel about that proposed research study. So uh, it may happen yet. OK, all right. So I want to thank you all very much for the lively discussion that we've had today. And there is undoubtedly more nuance and experience that has to be gained as we move into this next chapter of TAVI. But I think what is crystal clear to all of us is that we must strive to achieve optimal index procedural outcomes to lay the best foundations for future treatment options. So I want to thank all of our panel members um, for their insights, their experience uh, and the lively discussion. Um, and most of all, we would, of course, like to thank you for watching and engaging. And until next time, it's goodbye from PCR webinars.